great. All right, so uh, thanks for the introduction and, and thanks again to the organizers for inviting me to be here today. Um, so as mentioned, uh, I'm an assistant professor at the IU School of Medicine, uh, but I actually just started my independent career about seven months ago. And so, um, you know, in the past seven months, my students and I have been working really hard to get things up and going. And uh, we're now firing on all cylinders, but uh, today I'm gonna be sharing work that I did as a postdoc uh, in Dieter Soul's lab at Yale. And this project was focused on uh, developing split uh, amino acyl tRNA synthetases as new tools to control gene expression uh, in bacteria and eukaryotes. All right, so I wanna begin uh, by just giving uh, a little bit of a background. Um, and these first couple slides I give every time I give a lecture on genetic code expansion, and I consider taking them out for this talk since it's more of a specialized audience. But uh, you know, then it occurred to me that this is the genetic code expansion for all webinar series, and so I didn't want to leave anyone out. And so this is just a little bit of a background that might be a review for most of you. But um, this is an overview of translation, and um, you'll recall that amino acyl tRNA synthetases are a group of enzymes. Uh, that are responsible for recognizing natural amino acids and uh, correctly attaching them onto their corresponding tRNA. So this is a critical step, a uh, critical checkpoint in protein synthesis. Once formed then, uh, this amino acyl tRNA migrates to the ribosome where it introduces this amino acid into a newly synthesizing protein chain. And so um, most life on earth uh, synthesizes proteins using just 20 different amino acid building blocks. And so because of this, most organisms only encode 20 unique amino acyl tRNA synthetase enzymes. And so a focus of our field, genetic code expansion, uh, is to engineer cells that have additional amino acyl tRNA synthetase and tRNA pairs so that we can produce proteins containing additional unnatural amino acids. And so to do this, uh, we take the genes that encode an amino acyl tRNA synthetase and a tRNA pair, and we transplant these genes from organisms in one domain of life, so typically an archaeon, uh, into an organism in a second domain of life. So typically we go from archaea to a bacterium or a eukaryote. And by transplanting these molecules, uh, we can generate cells that have a 21st amino acyl tRNA synthetase and tRNA pair. And these transplanted enzyme and tRNA uh, can function in this cell and participate in this process of translation. And because this is a naturally uh, derived or a naturally occurring amino acyl tRNA synthetase. Uh, it's going to recognize one of the natural amino acids such as tyrosine, and this enzyme can function to install tyrosine into proteins in the cell. So in our field, uh, we use uh, rational design and directed evolution to modify these transplanted enzymes such that they no longer recognize their native substrates and will instead recognize uh, an unnatural amino acid. And so this is just one example of this that this has been done for. And if we provide this unnatural amino acid into the growth media uh, of cells expressing the modified amino acyl tRNA synthetase, uh, the enzyme will attach this amino acid onto its cognate tRNA. And then this tRNA can install the amino acid into proteins uh, during normal ribosomal protein synthesis. So typically um, this is done using tRNAs that either naturally uh, recognize the UAG stop codon or are modified to recognize this codon. Uh, so UAG is one of three um, codons that don't normally encode an amino acid. Instead, they tell the ribosome where to stop protein synthesis. Uh, but by using tRNAs that can recognize UAG, uh, we can effectively change the meaning of this codon from signaling stop uh, to signaling the incorporation of our unnatural amino acid. And so then by programming the position of the UAG codon uh, within the encoding gene, we can program the position of the unnatural amino acid within the final protein product. All right, so I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with all of that already. And um, over the past 20 years since its inception, genetic code expansion has been used uh, for a lot of um, uh, unique and, and very interesting applications. And I think you're learning about a lot of those applications in this webinar series. So one application that we were interested in using genetic code expansion for was to use this system as a tool to control gene expression at the level of translation uh, by regulating stop codon suppression. So for example, uh, genetic code expansion has been used uh, to control, excuse me, for biocontainment um, to control the expression of genetically modified viruses. And so um, to do this, a UAG stop codon uh, is inserted into one of the essential viral genes uh, with the idea being that this protein encoded by this gene will not be produced unless we 
provide an exogenous unnatural amino acid. Uh, the amino acid is attached onto the suppressor tRNA, suppressing the stop codon, allowing for translation of this gene. So in a similar way, um, genetic code expansion has also been used to control the expression of therapeutic proteins, such as insulin. Um, and again, the idea here is we can insert a UAG stop codon uh, within the insulin gene, and then we can control the expression of this gene uh, by adding an unnatural amino acid to induce stop codon suppression. So um, with both of these examples, um, we're relying on a fundamental assumption, and that is that in the absence of an unnatural amino acid, um, this protein is not going to be produced because translation will, will stall at this UAG stop codon. However, the, the problem with these types of systems is that these engineered amino acyl tRNA synthetases are not uh, perfect enzymes. And so um, what happens is although they prefer unnatural amino acids as substrates, very often in the absence of their preferred substrate, uh, they can recognize natural amino acids to some degree. And so what we find is that in the absence of an unnatural amino acid, uh, the enzyme will attach a natural amino acid onto the suppressor tRNA. And this allows for um, low level background translation of this gene. And in some cases, this, this background can actually be quite significant. And you can imagine that, that this can prohibit us using genetic code expansion to control gene expression if it's a very sensitive application, uh, such as for biocontainment or for controlling the expression of therapeutic proteins. And so uh, this kind of leads me to the motivation for the project that I want to discuss today. And, and that is we wanted to find a way to more tightly control gene expression using genetic code expansion. And we focused on uh, the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. And uh, specifically, we wanted to find a way to regulate the activity of the amino acyl tRNA synthetase such that we could turn it on when we wanted to induce stop codon suppression and turn it off when we did not want to induce stop codon suppression. So our strategy for developing an amino acyl tRNA synthetase that could be activated on demand was to make use of chemically induced dimerization systems. Uh, so chemically induced dimerization uh, systems are protein domains uh, that themselves do not interact with, one each, with, e with each other. Uh, but in the presence of a small molecule ligand, uh, these proteins assemble to form a stable dimer. And so these types of domains have been used in the past to control the activity of uh, many different enzymes. And to do this, uh, an enzyme is split into an N-terminal and a C-terminal fragment. And then these fragments are genetically fused to one of the two uh, dimerization domains. And so the idea here is that themselves, the N-terminal and C-terminal fragments of the split enzyme are inactive. Um, but in the presence of the small molecule, these domains assemble into a dimer and that causes our enzyme fragments to assemble into their active form. And so in this way, the small molecule really acts as a molecular switch to uh, turn the enzyme on. And so, you know, as I mentioned, this has been done uh, for many different enzymes, including um, RNA polymerases and proteases. And we wanted to know, could we use a similar strategy to control the activity uh, of an orthogonal amino acyl tRNA synthetase? So the enzyme that we chose as a model for our system uh, is, was the pyrolysyl tRNA synthetase, or PILRS. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this enzyme. We, we just heard about it in the previous talk. Um, PILRS is really... Um, a widely used enzyme in genetic code expansions for a number of reasons. I've spent my career studying this enzyme. Um, it's been engineered to recognize over 100 unique unnatural amino acids, and it's orthogonal in both bacteria and eukaryotes, so it can be used to install those amino acids into proteins in, in a wide variety of uh, model organisms. So our first goal was to split PILRS into N-terminal and C-terminal fragments that themselves were inactive, but that could be activated when they were brought into proximity. And so uh, to do this, using the crystal structure as a guide, uh, we identified seven sites on the enzyme that we thought would be ideal uh, for cleaving the enzyme into two fragments. Uh, those sites are shown on this topology map as um, orange circles or on the crystal structure as orange spheres. And I'm just rotating this structure so that you can see uh, we chose sites that were primarily located at surface exposed, uh, unstructured loops. And um, we avoided two, two interfaces of the enzyme. One was uh, this side right here, which is the, the interface that the enzyme um, is thought to make a dimer with the second protomer. And then this back face here, uh, which is the interface that the enzyme interacts with its tRNA. All right, so PILRS was split into N-terminal and C-terminal fragments at seven positions. Uh, and then these um, enzyme fragments were genetically fused to a pair of peptides called SYNZIP17 and SYNZIP18. 
So these are synthetic uh, coiled coil peptides that are known to interact uh, strongly with one another. And again, the idea is that uh, our split enzyme fragments would be inactive and unable to self-assemble, and that it would be the interaction between these peptides that would drive assembly to generate our active amino acyl tRNA synthetase. Um, now, these Sensit peptides are relatively small, but uh, we were concerned that by fusing them to the enzyme, we would um, interfere with the activity of PILRS. And so the peptides were fused to the enzyme fragments uh, using these uh, flexible polyglycine linkers shown here. All right, so our first goal was to, you know, just determine, do our split enzymes retain any activity at all? And so to do this, um, we used a GFP-based assay in which we co-expressed the uh, Sensit fused N-terminal and C-terminal pyloras fragments uh, in E. coli that were simultaneously expressing our pyrolysine tRNA and the GFP reporter gene harboring an in-frame uh, TAG stop codon. And so under normal condi conditions, um, GFP will not be produced in these cells uh, because translation of this gene will stop at TAG. Uh, however, if our split enzymes are active, uh, they're going to recognize an unnatural amino acid that we provide into the growth media of these cells. Uh, the enzyme will attach the amino acid onto our suppressor tRNA, allowing for GFP production, which, you know, that we can then measure using our fluorescence plate reader. So we measured GFP expression in these cells, um, and we did this for pylorus that was split at each of the, the predetermined split sites. And uh, as you can see, we did this in the presence and absence of the unnatural amino acid, uh, uh, meta-iodophenylalanine. And for most of our split enzymes, uh, we observed significant GFP expression only in the presence of the unnatural amino acid, um, indicating to us that the split enzymes retained uh, amino isolation activity and were able to charge the tRNA uh, with the unnatural amino acid still. So next we asked, um, was the interaction between the Sensit peptides required for the activity that we observed? Um, in other words, you know, it's possible that the N-terminal and C-terminal fragments of pylorus themselves uh, could spontaneously self-assemble uh, without the help of these interacting Sensit peptides. And so here we wanted to rule that out as a possibility. So to do this, uh, we again used the, the GFP-based assay, uh, but this time we systematically deleted either Sensit 17 or Sensit 18 from the system. And then we measured GFP expression in these cells and we did this for the pylorus variants, our two most active pylorus variants, and, and those were the variants split at position Q23 and position D137. And so as you can see from these data here, again, this is GFP expression. Um, for the Q23 variant, uh, we found that um, GFP expression only occurred in the presence of the unnatural amino acid as expected, um, but we observed significant GFP expression with only one of the two Sensit peptides. Uh, indicating that this enzyme variant was capable of um, self-assembling without the interacting peptides. But for the D137 variant, um, GFP expression only occurred significantly um, when both of the Sensit peptides were present, uh, demonstrating that it really was the interaction between these two peptides that was responsible for restoring activity of our amino acyl tRNA synthetase. And so for our future experiments, we carried on with the uh, variant of the enzyme that was split at position D137. All right, so all the data I've shown so far were collected using these synthetic um, Sensit peptides. Um, and these peptides are really useful for screening split enzymes, but you know themselves, they're not really all that interesting. Um, and so we wanted to know, could we use our split amino acyl tRNA synthetase as a more general tool for detecting interactions between biologically relevant protein-protein interactions, biologically relevant proteins? And so um, we focused on the BCL2 family of proteins, uh, which are um, involved in regulating apoptosis. And specifically we asked, could we detect the interaction between the anti-apoptotic protein BCL2 and the pro-apoptotic protein T-bid or truncated bid? And so we genetically fused uh, T-bid and BCL2 uh, to our split pylorus enzyme, and then co-expressed these fragments uh, in E. coli uh, with our GFP reporter and then measure GFP expression in the cells. And as we can see from these data here, uh, we found um, high levels of GFP expression um, only in the presence of the unnatural amino acid, uh, indicating that the interaction between TBID and BCL2 was also capable of restoring activity of our split enzyme. So as a negative control, uh, we used a variant of TBID known as DEADBID. Uh, DEADBID is a mutant that is known to not be able to bind to BCL2. 
And as you can see with our negative control, the GFP expression was not significantly greater than the background signal, uh, further demonstrating that it really is the interaction between these two proteins that's, that's restoring the activity of the enzyme. So to sort of um, measure the generality of our, of our system, uh, we also asked if we could detect the interaction between a second member of the BCL2 family, a protein called MCL1, uh, which also binds to TBID. And again, uh, we found um, the GFP signal uh, relied on the addition of the unnatural amino acid and um, was high in the presence of the unnatural amino acid. And then with our negative control dead bid, uh, the signal was not significantly greater uh, than background. And so um, in addition to this, I don't have time to go into it today, but we've also used this system to detect um, other protein-protein interactions, including um, interactions between portions of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And so I think we've demonstrated that this really can be used as a general tool for de detecting these types of interactions. All right, but then um, back to our main point, uh, we wanted to develop an amino acyl tRNA synthetase that could be activated uh, using these chemically induced dimerization domain. What a great time for a fire drill, huh? Um, I don't know, should I continue? Uh, we can't hear it actually. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> but that doesn't mean there's not a fire. Uh, uh, that's, I'll go tell the fire department. Leave it up to you. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so we wanted to um, identify a split enzyme that could be activated using these chemically induced dimerization systems. And so the system we chose relies on the small molecule abscisic acid. So abscisic acid is a plant hormone. And as part of the stress pathway in plants, um, abscisic acid binds to a protein called ABI. Uh, and upon doing so, um, ABI is then able to bind to a second protein called pile. So in this way, the, the, the key point is that the interaction between ABI and pile only occurs in the presence of abscisic acid. So we genetically fused um, ABI to the N-terminus of pylor S, and we fused uh, pile to the C-terminus of pylor S. And then we asked, could we use abscisic acid um, to control the activity of our split enzyme? So again, uh, using our trusty GFP assay, uh, we co-expressed the ABI and pile fused uh, pylor S fragments uh, in E. coli cells with our GFP recorder. And then we measured GFP expression in these cells and the presence and absence, uh, this time of two small molecules, uh, abscisic acid and meta-iodophenylalanine. And so as uh, we can see from these data here, this is GFP expression in these cells. Um, high levels of GFP expression were only observed in the presence of both the abscisic acid and the um, unnatural amino acid substrate for the enzyme. Um, demonstrating that the abscisic acid was able to induce dimer formation between ABI and pile, and, and that that itself was able to restore activity of the split amino acyl tRNA synthetase. Now, I just want to point out that the fact that we developed a system uh, that requires these two molecular inputs to achieve a biological output is, is notable because uh, essentially what we've created here is a genetically encoded digital logic gate, or um, you know, specifically a genetically encoded AND gate, um, wherein two molecular inputs uh, achieve a desired output, in this case, abscisic acid and iodophenylalanine uh, uh, produce the stop codon suppression. So these types of um, genetically encoded logic gates are useful synthetic biology tools uh, for developing uh, novel gene circuits. So all of the data so far have been collected using a GFP reporter, but one of the nice things about this system is that it's compatible with virtually any reporter since essentially what we're measuring here is stop codon suppression in our reporter gene. So to confirm the results that we obtained with our GFP reporter, uh, we used a complementary reporter and that is the chloramphenicol acetyltransferase gene. Uh, so this gene confers resistance to the antibiotic chloramphenicol. And again, because of this in frame stop codon, uh, these cells will only be able to grow on chloramphenicol if our split amino acyl tRNA sympathase is active and able to charge the suppressor tRNA. So we co-expressed the ABI and pile fused pile RS fragments uh, in E. coli cells expressing uh, this chloramphenicol acetyltransferase reporter. And then we challenged these cells to grow on media containing an unnatural amino acid um, and the antibiotic in the presence and absence of abscisic acid. And so as we can see from these data here, um, these cells were only able to grow on media containing the antibiotic chloramphenicol uh, when abscisic acid was also provided in the growth media. 
And so these data just further um, demonstrate that the abscisic acid is able to really um, control the activity of our split amino acyl tRNA synthetase. So, um, you know, one of the downsides of using uh, split enzyme-based systems is that very often split enzymes have significantly lower activity than the parent enzyme, or that is, you know, the enzyme that's not split. And our um, amino acyl tRNA synthetase was no exception to this rule. Uh, the first generation of the enzyme had, had pretty low activity. And so, um, you know, with the goal of improving the activity of our split enzyme, we asked, um, would varying the length of the linker between the pylor S fragment and the ABI and pile proteins be able to improve the activity of the enzyme? So to answer this question, we created a series of um, pylor S variants with different uh, linkers containing this glycine serine glycine motif, uh, where N here equals zero to six. And as we can see, uh, in general, we found that with longer linkers, uh, there was a significant increase in the activity of our split enzyme. Uh, but with the increase in activity came an increase in the background signal and the absence of the unnatural amino acid, but in the presence of abscisic acid. And you know, this background was not unexpected because um, when we add the abscisic acid, we're activating the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. And as I told you at the beginning of my talk, these enzymes are able to recognize natural amino acids to a small degree. And so that is what this background signal is coming from. Our mutant enzyme is able to recognize um, a natural amino acid, and that's why we get this increase in signal. And this really, I think, highlights uh, the usefulness of this approach, because when we take away the abscisic acid, we see a significant decrease in that signal, um, only slightly higher than, than the background in the absence of both of these small uh, compounds. All right, so um, as a trade-off between activity and background signal, we carried on with the uh, N equals four linker as our optimized variant. So if we compare the activity of the uh, N equals four variant to the wild type enzyme, the enzyme that's not split, uh, we found that it retained about 37% of the activity uh, as measured with our GFP assay. And uh, we were pretty satisfied with this. This was pretty good if we compare it to um, the activity of other split enzymes that are reported in the literature. All right, and then finally, uh, we wanted to know if we could use our split pyrrole isotyrene synthetase uh, to control the activity, uh, uh, excuse me, to control gene expression in uh, eukaryotic cells. And so to do this, uh, we co-expressed uh, the ABI and pile-fused pylor S fragments um, as one gene uh, using this self-cleaving uh, T2A peptide that we heard about in the last talk. Um, and this gene was co-expressed with eight copies of the pyrolysine tRNA and as a reporter, we used a secreted embryonic alkaline phosphatase uh, that contained an N-frame TAG codon. And we measured expression of this reporter gene uh, in hex cells that were cultured in the presence and absence of two small molecules, uh, cystic acid. And this time we used Bach lysine as a substrate for the uh, enzyme. So as we can see here, this is seep expression data. Um, in the absence of one or both of these small molecules, um, seep expression was not significantly greater than the background signal. Um, but when we added both abscisic acid and Bach, we found a significant increase in, in a reporter gene expression. And then notably, um, we could um, titrate the expression. So the expression of the reporter gene increased with the concentration of the abscisic acid that we added to the growth medium. All right, so I'm, I just want to briefly mention that all of the data I showed today were, were collected using pylorest as a model enzyme. Uh, but we've also demonstrated that we could split uh, the tyrosyl tRNA synthetase from mGenashi. Uh, this is another enzyme that's widely used for genetic code expansion applications. Uh, and both of these enzymes can be used uh, to detect various protein-protein interactions. And we're now working on um, multiplexing these enzymes. So using them together in the same cell to have multifaceted control over gene expression in cells. So with that, um, I just wanna say thanks to a few people. Uh, Professor Brian Dickinson uh, at the University of Chicago and his postdoc, Kristen Jones, were really helpful when we were trying to design our split enzymes. Uh, Danny Zhang, was a graduate student at Yale. Um, Christina Chung is a, was a postdoc with me um, at Yale. She's now working at a biotech startup in Boston. Uh, Nikki Ambrose was a very talented undergraduate student who's working as a research chemist at um, Sherwin-Williams in Pennsylvania. And then I wanna say thanks to my postdoc advisor, Dieter Soul. I think probably many in the audience are familiar with Dieter. Uh, he's kind of a giant in the field of genetic code expansion. And uh, Dieter's actually retiring next month after a very long and successful career in science. And uh, he, I'll be traveling back to New Haven to celebrate his retirement. And uh, he was instrumental in helping me uh, secure my independent position. So I, I definitely want to give him a thanks. 
Thanks again to the organizers for inviting me and I'm happy to answer any questions. That was great, thank you. Um, I have a quick question about how you, um, you picked a several sites to split the enzyme and then you went forward to that and you did a bunch of optimization on linker size linker length and whatnot do you ever go into that original site and move it you know up two positions my you know five prime three prime and, and try to optimize it that way or you uh have you did you do that and is this like a, a i don't know something that you do for for when you split enzymes <laughs> yeah it's a good question so you know there's there's two ways you can address it you can just try and rationally pick a site or yeah. or what, what others have done is build libraries where they split it you know in many different sites and so we didn't we we just chose the seven sites and we picked the best one and you know i've often wondered what if we went one or two residues over how would that affect the activity um, so, you know, you can spend a, a long lot time of optimizing it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you, you got to work and that's the, that's yep. the important thing. Yeah.